Okay, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We're doing a uh, Christian Basics class, and we spent the last several weeks, well, Ernie filled in for me last week, and I do appreciate that. But uh, before then, we've been going over the Israel of God, and we're talking about how, although God made promises to physical nation of Israel, to physical Jews, the promises only applied to those who believed Him, to believe the gospel. So in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, you have a continuation of God uh, wanting to fulfill His promises to Israel, and what He's doing is He's breaking out a believing remnant. He's separating believing Israel from the apostate nation of Israel. And this is all according to prophecy. And, um, and so now we went through in the book of Acts, and we saw that... When you get to the first part of Acts, and we'll just go there right now, Acts chapter 1, you notice the last conversation that Jesus has with the disciples. He's with them. Acts 1 verse 3 says that the disciples saw him uh, being seen of them 40 days. Uh, so Jesus, uh, the disciples saw Jesus for 40 days after the resurrection. You notice from Acts 1 3, and Acts 1, 3, I'm just going to write these down so you can see Acts 1, 3, those 40 days Jesus was with the disciples there. It says, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the focus in those 40 days is the kingdom of God. The last thing that the disciples asked Jesus in Acts 1, verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, he says it's not for you to know uh, the answer to that question, but in verse 8 says, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then when he had spoken these things, uh, he was taken up. So you have them asking in Acts 1.6 about uh, kingdom... For Israel, so again, the uh, focus, we're after the cross, and Jesus ascends to the Father. When you are in early Acts here, the focus is still on Israel's program, is the point. Uh, Jesus didn't say, after he rose from the day, he said, well, you know, we gave Israel a chance, but they crucified me, so uh, we're going to set them aside, and we're going to start the church, the body of Christ, and I want you to go to Gentiles. Now, you see the focus in those 40 days. He only has 40 days with the disciples before he goes to the Father. The limited time because he needs to send them the Holy Ghost, as Acts 1.8 says, so they have the power to then uh, understand the things of God that Jesus had taught them and also to proclaim the gospel and do miracles and those things to get people saved. And you notice the focus in those 40 days is still, verse 3, on the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, such that the apostles believe that the kingdom is now going to be restored to Israel, verse 6, in spite of the fact that they just crucified their Messiah. So the focus is still on Israel here. Then when you get to uh, the Holy Ghost is given here in uh, Acts chapter 2, and the people ask, uh, you know, what meaneth this? They ask in Acts 2 verse 12, this they're speaking in new tongues. Well, I shouldn't say new tongues. They're speaking in other tongues. They are speaking in known languages by the audience. But the disciples do not know the languages that they are speaking. But the people hear in their own languages the wonderful works of God. And so then Peter addresses the people there. You see in Acts 2.14. In Acts 2.14 he says... Ye men of Judea, so he addresses men in Judea, uh, verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel, and then in verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel know. So the audience here is Israel, it is not Gentiles, it is not starting something new, it's not the body of Christ, it's a continuation of Israel's program. But it's at a very critical phase, because from Acts 2 and verse 23, 
we see that they have taken Jesus and crucified him by wicked hands. So that's not a good thing. But uh, verse uh, 32, Acts 2.32 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, Exalted there means that he has, since he's conquered death and hell, he is now Lord over all. Uh, Colossians 2, a good cross-reference to understand what that means, exalted there. In Colossians chapter 2, we are told that uh, Jesus Christ in verse 13, Colossians 2, 13, that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of all our trespasses, because, verse 14, he blotted out the head and writing of ordinances that was against us, nailing it to his cross. The power that Satan had over us to keep us from being reconciled to God is the fact that we were under a law and that we had broken that law and the wages of sin is death. Therefore, we earn death. But Jesus conquered death through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so Colossians 2.15 says that he spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. So when Acts 2, verse 33 says that Jesus is at the right hand of God exalted, what it means is he is, as Ephesians 1 will tell you, in Ephesians 1, it tells you in verse 20, in Ephesians 1 verse 20, that, that God raised Christ from the dead and set him, set Christ at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So we learn from Colossians 2 15 and Ephesians 1 20. And 21, so Colossians 2, 15, and Ephesians 1, 20, and 21, that what the word exalted means there in Acts 2, at the right hand of God exalted. Jesus at the right hand of God exalted means that he is over all. This, this right here tells you, Colossians and Ephesians, that he has defeated Satan's forces through the cross, through cross, and so he's at the right hand of God exalted, meaning he is King of kings, Lord of lords. He is over all, which is why in Acts 2 now, and verse 36, in Acts 2, 36, it says, This same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, God hath made him both Lord and Christ. So he's Lord over all because he defeated Satan's forces through the cross. And he's the Christ, meaning he is the, he's the uh, Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one that won the victory. So he is ruler over all because he won the victory over death and hell by spoiling the power that Satan's forces had over us. Now, in the context of Acts, it's talking about the, the power that they had over Israel. Uh, but, of course, the, the power of death and hell is over not just Israel, but it's also over all, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all subject to the power of death as a result of our sin. And then Jesus Christ wins the victory. So, going back to Acts 2 now, you see in verse 33 that he's at the right hand of God exalted. And then it says what he's supposed to do. So he's at the right hand of God exalted. He's got that power. So then, verse 34, what Peter does, and really the Holy Ghost through Peter, Peter is he quotes Psalm 110 and verse 1. It says there in Acts 2.34, he says, For David is not ascended into the heavens. In other words, David wrote Psalm 110, but he's not talking about himself there. He's saying that David is given a prophecy of, of his Lord. He saith himself, in Psalm 110 verse 1, 
the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So the, so the Lord is uh, God, but my Lord is Jesus Christ. The way Jesus is my Lord is because he's the one who conquered death and hell for me. Okay, before, before when, I'm, when I sin, the wages of sin is death, death has power over me, so my Lord, before I'm saved, is Satan. Because he's got de the power of death over me. But because Jesus Christ defeated Satan's forces through the cross, he defeated death and hell. So that's why verse 36 says, This Jesus whom ye have crucified, God's made him both Lord and Christ. So when I, for me today, when I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, God says, Satan's not your Lord anymore. He, he, you're not going to be in hell. Instead, Jesus Christ is now your Lord. Because he has given you the gift of eternal life by applying his blood as atonement for your sins. So now you've got eternal life, and now he is right at the right hand of God exalted, Lord of Lords. Now, if you don't believe the gospel, you never believe the gospel, then Satan ends up being your Lord. So that's why it says in verse 34, when so when the Lord is at the right hand of God exalted. Jesus Christ there, he's Lord of Lords. He's over all. It says in Acts 2.34, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, right hand is the position of power, until I make thy foes thy footstool. So Satan and everybody associated with Satan. So he's going to sit, according to the prophecy, and this is important for us where we are, because we finished out in Acts 7. We didn't get to finish Acts 7 last time, two weeks ago. So we're going to go back there. We need to understand that he's at the right hand of God exalted. And according to Acts 2, 34 and 35, which is a quote of um, Psalm 110, verse 1. So it's a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus is going to sit so it's what's saying, Jesus sits until foes are defeated, basically. Now, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, although Jesus has won the victory uh, over death and hell, and, you know, theoretically, God could just say, okay, well, all those who have believed the gospel are saved, uh, God doesn't want anybody to perish. So he's going to give a time a time period in which people will have an opportunity to believe the gospel and be safe so that they don't have to go to hell. I mean, that's the whole purpose Jesus died. God wants all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Jesus conquers death and hell. There is no, there's no benefit to it. Even though he defeats Satan and his forces, there's no benefit to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection if none of us actually believe the gospel. So... Um, so he's going to, so Jesus has done the work. And now there's that time period that God is going to long suffer with his people and determine and say, okay, you're going to sit at my right hand until the foes are defeated. So when the foes are defeated then, then he will stand up and he will then go ahead and destroy the enemies, um, which ends up being the Antichrist and his forces, and then bring in God's kingdom on earth is basically what it's saying. So that's where we are in Israel's prophecy. So we left off two weeks ago in Acts 7. So we need to pick up back there to see what was going on. We saw before that God gave opportunities to remember the uh, God of separating out a believing remnant. He said that uh, the, the prophecy... And here, let's, let's read that prophecy again. Remind you of that. Jeremiah 23. In Jeremiah 23, there's the prophecy. The problem is, in verse 1, Jeremiah 23, verse 1, that the, the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders of Israel, are not doing their job. Religious leaders of Israel are supposed to point people toward the law to trust in God to save them. 
And instead, the religious leaders have come up with their own religion and their own traditions. That Jesus says, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. And so he's saying that you know, these religious leaders are supposed to lead them to God. Jesus is going to provide the sacrifice. They need to trust in God to save them. But instead, they're trusting in their own righteousnesses through their own religion. And so uh, God says in Jeremiah 23 and verse 1, Jeremiah 23, verse 1, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. So, I'm doing my job, God says, but the religious leaders are not. So then he says in verse 4, uh, well, verse 3, he says, Jeremiah 23, 3, what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I've driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So according to Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4, God says that he is going to take, he's going to replace religious leaders Basically, the unbelieving apostate religious leaders, he's going to replace them with believers. And we covered the verses before, Matthew 21, 43, Luke 12, which shows that these, these religious leaders in Jesus' day are the Pharisees. And the believers that are going to be the new pastors, or the new, what are they called? Shepherds, the shepherds. The believers are uh, the apostles. And all those who are with them that believe. So th this is uh, when we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. We learn that's the that's the plan. That's the fulfillment of Jeremiah twenty three one through four. The religious leaders that destroy and scatter my pasture are the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the lawyers. All those religious leaders of Jesus' day, and the new shepherds he's going to set up are the believers, which end up being the twelve apostles and you know others that believe as well. So that's the plan. So that's why when you're in Acts 2, that's why Peter stands up and the Holy Ghost speaks through Peter. The, the Holy Ghost, remember he said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Holy Ghost is sent by Jesus to these people, to the believers. The Holy Ghost is on them. Now the nation as a whole still recognizes the Pharisees and those as the religious leaders. But as far as God is concerned, the believers are now the new leaders. They are the new shepherds because God is going to work through them through the Holy Ghost. But the problem is, so if they believe that message, that uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, if they believe that message, then this works. But the problem is they do not believe. And we saw, I think last time, we saw in Acts 4, uh, verse 3, there are three strikes here. Basically, uh, Acts 4, verse 3 is the first one, where you see that uh, the disciples here, uh, they, they laid hands on them, put them in hold until the next day. So they arrest. These are the, the believers, the apostles are the leaders, the new shepherds over... Uh, God's Israel of God, and yet in Acts 4, 3, they are taken and arrested. And then we see in uh, Acts 5 and 17 and 18, we see strike number 2. Acts 5, 17 and 18, there the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And then now we're in Acts chapter 7. And here is Stephen. If you look down in Acts 7 and verse uh, 55. In Acts 7 verse 55 it says that Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost. And what they did with him there is... And by the way, he is at a council there... Uh, you see in uh, Acts uh, 6 that they arrested Stephen 
And in verse 12, they brought him for, before the religious council, set up false witnesses. Uh, in verse 15, Acts 6.15, you can see the council there. And then in Acts 7, verse 1, the high priest asked him, are these things so? So when Stephen speaks in Acts 7, it's the Holy Ghost speaking through Stephen, but when this happens, it is the... Uh, it is the context is that Stephen is brought before the high priest and these religious leaders before a council. And so there is a, basically an official council in which they end up stoning him. You notice in verse 59, Acts 7, 59, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So Acts 7, 59 is strike three. So, Jesus wins the victory over death and hell, but it really doesn't do any good unless people actually believe the gospel and are saved. God says, I'm going to replace their religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, with new shepherds, believers, the apostles, but uh, they are unable to take over due to the apostasy of Israel. That they arrest him in Acts 4.3, they put him in prison again in Acts 5, 17, and 18. And Acts 7, 59, they find that they stoned Stephen. So because of that, you see in uh, what happens if you look in Acts 7, 54 now, Acts 7, verse 54, Acts 7, 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And we mentioned the difference there, the... Uh, the ones who are in outer darkness, Jesus said in the book of Matthew, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's, uh, Jesus also said that the Pharisees are of their father, the devil, in John 8, 44. And so basically what they're doing is they're doing what they're going to be doing in hell. And they're gnashing. And they're cut to the heart. They don't do like the ones in Acts 2 when they're pricked in the heart and they say, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. They don't do that. They're not, they're not pricked in the heart. says, oh no, we're doing something bad. What do we do about it? No. No, what they do is they try to get rid of the Holy Ghost and what Jesus is doing by trying to replace them with these believers, uh, with the apostles. And so they gnash on him with their teeth. And now verse 55, Acts 7, 55 says, but he, that Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost. So again, it's trying to, tell you that what's happening right here is they're rejecting the Holy Ghost. And what is said here is not just, um, you know, a vision. Like, like you hear somebody, they'll say, well, you know, I had a near-death experience and I saw this light and I saw Jesus or I did. And you, you look at it and you say, well, I don't really know if I can believe that, right? Because, um, you know, are they just making it up? Or are they, maybe they were hallucinating? Maybe, you know, there are all these things you think of, you think, I can't really, I'm not sure if I can buy that. You know, I don't know if I can believe it. So, Acts 7.55 tells you that he is full of the Holy Ghost. And we know the Holy Ghost is God. Titus 1.2 says that God cannot lie. So, what we're about to hear is, uh, is the words of the Holy Ghost speaking through Stephen and we know what he saw isn't just some near-death experience that's on a, on a talk show and you don't know if it's really true or not. I mean, this is 100% true because it's God, the Holy Ghost, speaking through Stephen. So it says in Acts 7.55, He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Standing on the right hand of God. So Jesus has stood up. And I know if we just read that verse and say, oh, well, this indicates a dispensational change, that Israel's program has been set aside and that God is going to start a new dispensation, the church, the body of Christ, the mystery program. Um, if you just read that verse, then you say, most people would say, well, what's the big deal, right? All he did was stand up. Um, so a lot of times what fundamental churchianity tells you is that, well, Jesus was standing up to welcome the first Christian martyr home uh, to, 
to, to heaven, to welcome him home. But uh, we don't have any scriptural evidence for that. We, we, that's why I went over, spent the first 30 minutes or so, going over all these other verses. Be, especially that Acts 2 passage, because Acts 2 specifically tells you, God told to Jesus, Acts 2, 34, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So, you know, just standing up doesn't mean much. You know, if, I, if I'm just, you know, I was sitting down earlier eating dinner, and then I stood up. Well, what does that mean? Well, you don't really know. Maybe it means I'm thirsty. Maybe i got to use the bathroom. Maybe I want to brush my teeth. Maybe I want to get ready for the message. You, know, you don't want to know what I'm going to do, right? But in Acts 2, God says, and God cannot lie, He says to Jesus, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. And we know that Jesus always does what His Father tells Him to do. We learn that from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was obedient, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the very fact that God says in Acts 2 that you are to sit until your foes are defeated, the very fact that Jesus has stood up means basically judgment is coming. Uh, continue reading the passage in Acts 7 so you can see. In Acts 7, 56, Acts 7, 56, said... Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So again, verse 56 tells you the same thing. Um, so it's important, you know, if earlier when I stood up after I ate the dinner, you know, it's not really that important if you were trying to tell, you know, what Eric did today. Standing up after I ate dinner, you probably, if you're going to record a, a what I did for today, you're probably not going to include that. That's not, that's some minor detail in my life. All I did, I mean, I stood up and sat down all day. You know, what's the big deal, right? But um, here, we know it's a big deal because prophecy says that Jesus is going to sit until his foes are defeated. And we're, so we're told that Jesus is standing on the right hand of God and we're told it twice. And a lot of times I try to repeat myself sometimes if it's an important point because I don't want people to miss it. Um, that's the same thing God does. You know, if it's something that's important that you really need to get, um, He says it twice. So if, if God says something once is important, you better pay attention. But if He says it twice, uh, it's really important. So He says it right in a row. Verse 55, Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Verse 56, Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So we know that this fact is important. Now, uh, then you notice also the reaction of the council. Now, the council, they know the Old Testament. You can remember they're children of the devil. And you think of the devil. The devil knows the Bible better than I do and better than you do. Um, but the difference between me and you and Satan is that Satan doesn't believe a word of it. I mean, God says what's going to happen. He says that Satan's going to be defeated in the end. He gives all the details. Satan doesn't believe it. Satan has his pride and thinks he can overcome it, you know? So, but we actually believe God's word. So, um, the Pharisees, being children, and the Sadducees, this council, being children of the devil, they know the Old Testament, but they just don't believe it. A great example is Matthew 2. The wise men traveled two years because they saw the star of the Messiah. And they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. Herod doesn't know anything about it. I don't know what you're talking about. So he goes to the scribes. The scribes say, oh yeah, Micah 5. Micah 5 says uh, he would be born in Bethlehem. The Bethlehem ever tell that thou be little among the tribes of Judah. Yeah, thou thee shall become a governor that shall rule my people Israel. They knew the passage. Micah 5, too, like Lonnie used to say, it was in the crispy section of your Bible. You know, the minor prophets that we don't read that much. Pharisees knew the minor prophets. I mean, when the Herod asked them, where, where is this Messiah going to be born? Right away, Bethlehem, Ephrata. Micah 5, too, we know that. But they didn't bother to go down the road to see him. But yet here are the wise men, spent two years to go see him. 
That's the difference between believers and unbelievers. So the unbeliever, Pharisees, Sadducees, this council, I mean, you're talking about the, the, count, the high council here, the high priest, the council of the Sanhedrin. I mean, you're not talking about lowly fishermen, ignorant men. These are learned scholars. They understand the Old Testament. So they know of this prophecy of Jeremiah 23. In fact, if they didn't, Jesus plainly told them in Matthew 21, 43, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing forth the fruit thereof. Uh, Jesus warned the Pharisees on uh, several occasions before he was killed that, uh, you know, Matthew 23, he kept going, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Uh, you know, he, time after time, Jesus warned the people. So they knew the religious leaders knew the Old Testament. They didn't believe it, but they knew it. And Jesus warned them of this taking place. And another verse, so you can see this, hold your place in Acts, look in Isaiah chapter 3. Here's another prophecy that's very important here. Isaiah chapter 3. Uh, he talks about, this is basically judgment, the context of Isaiah chapter 3 is the judgment of the Lord against Israel. Uh, you can see in verse uh, 1, Isaiah 3 verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, mighty man, man of war, judge, prophet. In other words, uh, he's judging um, Jerusalem and Judah for their unbelief. And uh, you, see, uh, you see in verse 8, Jerusalem is ruined, Judah is fallen. Spiritually speaking, they're following these religious leaders, so they're not saved, they're not following God. Um, verse 9 says, they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. I mean, they're just brazen about their sin. Uh, verse 11, he says, woe unto the wicked. Now, uh, verse 12, as for my people... Uh, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err. That's the Jeremiah 23, the religious leaders. Remember, they scatter, they destroy the pastors who scatter and destroy the sheep of my pasture. I'm going to replace them with uh, uh, the you know believers, basically new shepherds. And so he says, he says, look at verse 12. He says, my people, the believing remnant, they are children, spiritually speaking. Um, the people who rule over them are children and they're women. They don't really understand. They don't have the sound doctrine. They're, not, they're coming from a standpoint of unbelief. And he says, O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy past. So what's the Lord going to do? Well, he's going to remember the prophecy that sit at my right hand until I, until I make thy foes thy footstool, till the foes are defeated. So it says in verse 13 there, The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. So Isaiah 3.13 tells you that when it is time to judge these religious leaders, these apostate religious leaders who destroy and scatter the people of my pasture, he is going to uh, stand to judge the people. The Lord standeth to judge the people. And so that goes right in line with Psalm 110, verse 1, and Acts 2, 34 and 35. So that's why, that's why the Lord said in, those, in Acts 2 and Psalm 110, Sit at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So when it is time then for the foes to be defeated, the religious leaders will be replaced and the believing believers will, um, will rule with you, then what you need to do is stand. Your foes are defeated and now you're going to judge the people. You're going to judge them as apostate and basically what you're going to do is you're going to bring in the kingdom. So that's what prophecy said. But... If we go to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, there's another problem with, um, with what happens in Acts 7. Because Jesus is standing now, which means, prophetically speaking, he's standing to judge the people, Isaiah 3.13, 
uh, he's basically going to destroy the foes and now set up God's kingdom on earth. But we go back to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, and we can see the, the timeline, the 70 weeks of Daniel here. Daniel 9, verse 24. 70 weeks. So that's 70 weeks of years. 490 years. Are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And here is what's going to happen in the 490 years. To finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy. So basically what it's saying is I'm going to get Israel, they're going to stop their sin, they're going to trust in me, I'm going to make an end of sin by uh, being the sacrifice for their sins, and then uh, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring a, a set them under the new covenant, which will result in bringing in everlasting righteousness, which will seal up the vision and the prophecy, and then the most holy, the Lord Jesus Christ, will rule and reign God's kingdom on earth in Jerusalem with Israel as his priest under him. So the 490 years is what's, um, it's going to take the 490 years here, 70 weeks times 7 for that to take place. So we know that after 69 weeks, verse 26 says that a Messiah is cut off. There's a 7 weeks mentioned in verse 25, then another 3 score and 2, so 7 plus uh, 60 plus 2 is 69 weeks. So he is cut off. So at the end of 69 weeks, Messiah is cut off. Then there are some things that happen. Verse 26, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And then verse 27 tells you about the 70th week. He, that's the people, that's the prince that shall come. That's the Antichrist. The Antichrist shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All that, a lot of words basically to say that there is a man who will claim to be the Messiah. He's the Antichrist. He's going to make a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. And halfway through the seven years, he is going to uh, get rid of the Mosaic Law and have people bow down to his image, which is the abomination of desolation that's spoken about there, and, then, and take his mark. And if they don't bow down to his image, then they will be killed. If they do bow down to his image, God says they'll have their place in the lake of fire. So... The issue is that when Jesus, according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, you have a 490-year period to get to the point where Jesus can come back and destroy his enemies and set up God's kingdom on earth and create a new covenant with Israel, believing Israel, the believing remnant of Israel. Uh, it's going to take that 490 years. And... Prophetically speaking, at the time of Acts 7, 483 years have taken place. The seven years, uh, the, the Antichrist has not made a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. There has been no image of the beast or mark of the beast um, implemented. So the, the issue is that Jesus has stood up, which according to prophecy means... He's standing to judge the people, standing to judge the people, Isaiah 3.13, which means that he's going to come, destroy the religious leaders, the Pharisees, that the believers, the apostles, are now going to be a kingdom of priests and go out to the Gentiles in the millennial reign. That's what prophecy says. But that can't happen until the 70 weeks are fulfilled and there is still one week left at the time that Jesus stands up. So that's the issue. So Jesus, the prophecy says he stands up, he stands to judge the people. But the issue is Daniel 9.27 hasn't happened yet. And it says there in Daniel 9.24 that you've got to, in order to anoint the most holy, all these 70 weeks have to take place. 
And so what really takes place then here, when Jesus stands up, it's not him standing to judge the people, but he's standing to do something different. And that is something that you don't find in prophecy. It is something that we, well, I shouldn't say we, the Bible calls the mystery. That, and, and it goes all the way back to Genesis 1.1. Because in Genesis 1 1, I'm trying to think of what I should erase. <laughs> I think we'll go up here. So in Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then verse 2 says, And the earth. So God creates two realms, He creates heaven and and earth, but you don't really hear heaven talked about in your Old Testament. Up to this point, you don't really hear it talked about. Uh, we know from uh, verses here and there that there was, uh, that uh, like Ezekiel, like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, that Lucifer got prideful. He said he's going to exalt his throne above God. He is going to be the most high God, the most high God according to Genesis 14, is the possessor of heaven and earth. Uh, God says he's going to bring him low. Uh, we learn from Daniel 10 that uh, all of the high-ranking angels of God sided with Satan except for Gabriel and Michael. So we know there was a, a satanic rebellion in heaven. Job 15.15 15 says, The heavens are unclean in thy sight. So we know that there is a satanic rebellion in heavenly places that has taken place just from... Job 15, 15, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Daniel 10. Um, we know that, but really the focus of all Scripture from Genesis to Acts 7 has been on the earth. It, it's like, it, it's almost like God just sort of took it for granted that the heavens are unclean in His sight and He wasn't going to do anything about it. And that the earth is what he was trying to, is like, uh-oh, I, you know, Satan's got control of the heaven, well, maybe I can salvage the earth. I mean, that's sort of the idea, I think, that Satan had at this time. But what we find out, though, is that God, not, because he says, you know, in Exodus 19, he told them, tell Israel, you're going to be a kingdom of priests to me, for all the earth is mine. So all this focus is on the earth. But we find out when we get to Paul, that God had a plan for heaven all along. And, but he didn't reveal it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It is called, in 1 Corinthians, so heaven and earth focuses on earth, Genesis 1, 2. But when we get to Paul, we learn in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. In fact, let's start at verse 6. And look at verses 6 through 8. We learn that God gave some new information to Paul that had not been revealed before. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. The princes of this world are Satan and his forces. Uh, that come to naught. They are going to be destroyed in the future. But we, verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So we learn that there is some hidden wisdom of God that God had figured out before the world. But he kept it a secret. He didn't tell anybody. Well, why didn't he tell anybody? I mean, why is it that he focused on the earth before the world began? He had this hidden wisdom about heavenly places. Why didn't he reveal it? Well, verse 8 says, which none of the princes of this world knew, Satan and his forces did not know this, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In order to reconcile both heaven and earth back to God, 
God's plan was that the Lord Jesus Christ would die on a cross. And Je Jesus even said, look over in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12. Uh, just referring to, again, uh, John 12, 31. John 12, 31 through 33. Jesus mentions this, but it is not, it's still a mystery because um, verse 33 is a footnote added by the Holy Ghost when John writes it. In other words, when Jesus speaks, Jesus speaks verses 31 and 32. But verse 33, he does not speak. It's added by the Holy Ghost when he has John write this down. John 12, 31. By the way, this is about a week before the cross when he, when he states this. So it's, oh, he's almost it's at the end of his ministry, a week before the cross. John 12, 31, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now, Satan is thinking, earth. And he knows the revealed plan is to have Jesus die uh, as a sacrifice in the altar as the Lamb of God in the temple. So that's what, uh, that's what Satan thinks Jesus means. But Jesus says, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, looking at that, without reading verse 33, the natural interpretation of that is basically what he's saying Jesus is saying is that prophecy in Psalm 118 says that you are to take the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, offer Him upon the altar in the temple as, by faith as the Passover Lamb that will take away their sin. And if they do that by faith, then God will raise Jesus from the dead. And so, so they will, uh, He will die for their sins and He will raise from the dead. So then Israel by participating in that Passover lamb, then they are identified with his death his, and also his resurrection, so they'll have his life and they'll have eternal life there on earth in Jesus. Prophetically, that would be what that means. So when you read verse 32, and he says, if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me, the natural conclusion in the prophecy program is that if Jesus has the the power to be risen from the dead, then the result is that people can be saved, have eternal life, get a Jesus eternal life imputed unto them, and he will draw all men unto me. In other words, I'm going to reconcile the earth back to myself. That's the natural uh, reading of that based upon the information in the Old Testament. But the Holy Ghost tells you that's not really what's in view here. He's not saying that if you take me and offer me on the altar as the Passover lamb, and then God has the power to raise him from the dead, then people can have eternal life on the earth. Verse 33, this he said signifying what death he should die. So when he says that I will be lifted up from the earth, what he means is that I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And if I am lifted up on a cross, then I will draw all men unto me, meaning both Jews and earth can be reconciled back to God and Gentiles and the heavens can be reconciled to God. The Gentiles are what we are called, who believe today, the Gentiles, the body of Christ. Israel, they're called Jews uh, who believe in Israel's program. And... Uh, and so, when Jesus was sentenced to death, he was sentenced by the high priest, the Jewish council, and he was also sentenced to death by the Gentiles, the Roman ruler, Pilate. So you had both, both Jews and Gentiles were responsible for the death of Jesus, and so both of them then could have the death they could be identified with his death, which means that when he rises from the dead, they can also be identified with his life. So, what that tells you then, here, is that God's plan, the cross, was God's plan all along. But, 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8 says it's hidden, wisdom of God. 
Because if Satan and his forces knew that that was God's plan all along, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what God had to do is he had to keep the cross a secret. And the, cro the reason the cross is important is because that's how both Jews and Gentiles are saved. If, if all that happened was that Jesus was taken and sacrificed upon the altar in the temple, then that would have fulfilled the Mosaic law and the curse under that Mosaic law. But it would not have taken care of uh, the Gentile salvation. So it would take care of reconciling the earth back to God. But the fact that he has risen upon a cross, um, that's how he draws all men unto him. That's how he can reconcile both heavenly places and the earth back to himself. But God never revealed that because 1 Corinthians 2.8, if God did reveal it, Satan would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And because from Genesis 1 forward, all you hear God talking about is trying to reconcile the earth back to himself. Satan just assumes that he's won heavenly places. And so he doesn't have, uh, Satan has wisdom, but he doesn't figure out that the cross is actually going to backfire on me. I think this is going to destroy. I think that God wants Jesus sacrificed in the, on the altar in the temple. Therefore, if I have him killed on a cross, then then I can be possessor of heaven and earth. I can be the most high God. That's what Satan thinks because God's kept all this plan to reconcile heavenly places back to himself a secret. But really, the cross was God's plan all along and then that way he can reconcile both heaven and earth back to himself and Satan never saw it because God kept it a secret until then. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, you can see... Uh, again, this is part of God's plan here all along. Ephesians 1. And look at verse 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. It says, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So that's reconciled heaven back to God in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's the word we saw in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. So again, before the world, um, us in heaven is the idea there. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, verse 1, For this cause, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause, I, Paul. What's the cause? Well, the cause is, Ephesians 2, the end of that, that we are a holy temple in the Lord in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6 says that God hath raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus, I erased it, but Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, exalted in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6, we find out that God's exalted us and put us into Christ, so now we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now. Ephesians 2, 6. And that now what's happening is that there is a building, verse 21, a building that is growing unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So if I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now, and that God is building a holy temple, and I am that habitation of God through the Spirit, then that holy temple that God is building right now must be in heavenly places. So it shows the mystery, what the part of that mystery there is that uh, God builds temple in heaven with us. We are the temple in heavenly places. And that was his plan before the world began. And now, remember, God kept it a secret. It was hidden wisdom because if Satan knew it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But now, Acts chapter 9, Paul, we're after the cross. So the deed is done. 
Jesus has died not just for the sins of Israel, but also for the sins of Gentiles. His sacrifice will be that his blood will save us from our sins and will reconcile the earth back to God through Israel, but it will also reconcile heavenly places back to God through the body of Christ. And there's nothing Satan can do about it now because he's already had crucified the Lord of glory. Therefore, Jesus can now reveal to Paul from heaven about these details. So it says in chapter 3, verse 1, for this cause. Remember, what's the cause? That God is building a temple in heaven with us. Well, we need to know about that so we can be a, a good, so we can fit our role, fulfill our role in heavenly places. For this cause, Ephesians 3, 1, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Not, I'm preaching, he didn't say I'm preaching the same thing that Peter did. No, he says, it's the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. How that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and a few words, where, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse five, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And people look at that, see, oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, of course, it's, it's a secret, but Paul's preaching the same thing as Peter. They'll say, because it says, other age is not made known, but now it's revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So now Peter, James, John, all those people know it. They're his apostles. Wait a minute, though. This is taught to him by revelation. He made known unto me the mystery. You can hold your place there. Go to Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, you can see that, that Paul did not learn this mystery from the 12 apostles. So uh, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 3, we see uh, revelation of the mystery. Revelation of mystery. Church Andy's going to tell you, well, this started in Acts chapter 2, and so it's the Holy Ghost taught them, and so he's just learned the same thing as Peter, James, and John. But Galatians 1 says, Galatians 1, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11, Galatians 1, 11, Paul says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we find out that the revelation, comparing verse by verse with verse, Galatians 1, 11 and 12, the, the revelation is of Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it was not by man. Let me erase this here. There's a little more room here. So when you read, going back to Ephesians 3 now, and it says in verse 5, Ephesians 3, 5, that this mystery of Christ, by revelation, Ephesians 3, 3, by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. We know that the revelation of the mystery that Paul received was not from man. So he did not get it, not from Peter, James, John, etc. Not from those guys. It was revelation, according to Galatians 1, 11, and 12, it's revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed this mystery to him. You say, well, what about the holy apostles and prophets? Well, you go to the next chapter, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 tells you about Jesus in verse 8. Wherefore he saith, Ephesians 4, 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, when Jesus Christ ascended up on high, after his resurrection, he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, 
and gave gifts unto men. What are these gifts? Verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers there. So, what that tells you there in Ephesians 4, 8, and 11, Ephesians 4, 8, and 11 tells you that there are apostles and prophets that Jesus appointed from heaven. Jesus appointed these from heaven. Just so we can be clear on this, turn over to Matthew uh, chapter 9. Pat, Matthew chapter 9, so you can see about Peter, James, and John, those 12 apostles. So you can see how they were chosen. Um, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 36, it says, in fact, let's, uh, I don't know, the detail there probably isn't, it's probably better to go to a, uh, probably better to go to a parallel passage and um, probably the Luke account thinking, or maybe Mark. I, I don't think the detail is in Matthew that I want you to see. Okay, Mark, maybe. That's better than uh, Matthew. Not that one's better than the other. I mean, it's just the detail that I'm looking for. Uh, let's see, Luke 6... Uh, Okay, yes, let's look at the Luke 6 passage. Uh, they're all the different, they're all the same account, Matthew 9, uh, Mark 3, and Luke 6, but um, Luke 6 has the detail I'm looking for. Uh, so Luke 6, it says in verse 12. So Luke 6 and verse 12. And it came to pass, Luke 6, verse 12. This is the, how Jesus chose the 12 apostles. Peter, James, John, those people. So Luke 6, 12. It came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. And then verses 14 through 16 uh, give you the list. And then verse 17 and he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people. So you can see the way according to Luke 6, 12 through 13, the way that the, the 12 apostles of Israel are chosen by an all-night prayer. Basically, Jesus talks all night with the Father. And he says, you know, we got to have 12, Matthew 19 says you're going to have 12 men over judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the kingdom. So, um, you know, we got to pick these guys. So Jesus talks it over with the Father all night. He communes with them in prayer. So you can see the way that Jesus picked the apostles in Israel's program was he went out into a mountain to pray, continued all night in prayer unto God, and then had come up with his list and so then when it was day he called unto him his disciples and out of them he chose 12 whom he named apostles but yet in Ephesians chapter 4 we're told that, that for the mystery it says that Jesus after he ascended up on high Ephesians 4 8 when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and those gifts According to Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles some prophets. So what that tells you is that churchianity automatically tells you your condition. When you hear the word apostle, you automatically think Peter, James, John, 12 apostles. You just think of those guys. But what we're told there is that the 12 apostles of Israel were chosen by all night prayer. But the apostles that 
Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4 were chosen by Jesus when he ascended up on high. Then he gave the apostles and prophets. So this is a different group of apostles and prophets that came later. And it makes sense because remember in Ephesians 3, verse 3, by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And verse 5, which in other ages was not made known in the sons of men. So if this is brand new information, and look, it's not brand new in the sense that it's hidden wisdom of God before the world began. God came up with this information over 4,000 years before he revealed it to Paul. It's just you won't find it in Genesis through John. You won't find it until it was revealed to Paul. So since, since Jesus needed apostles to remember they were going to, and I erased it, but they were going to replace the leaders of Israel, the apostate leaders, and they're going to be the new shepherds of Jeremiah 23, 4, to lead Israel as a kingdom of priests on to reconcile the earth back to God. It makes sense that uh, when God says, I've got some hidden wisdom that I ordained before the world, that uh, now I'm revealing it to Paul, well, now I'm going to need some apostles or sent ones, that's what the word apostle means, sent ones, to go and give that information out so that now the heavenly places can be reconciled to God. Uh, so when Ephesians 3, 5 says, In other ages is not made known in the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, the apostles and prophets there are the ones that were appointed by Jesus from heaven after he ascended up on high, as opposed to the apostles and prophets of Israel's program, the apostles, 12 apostles of Israel, which, according to Luke 6, were chosen by an all-night prayer. And so that's why you'll see things like Ephesians 2, for example. Ephesians 2, we talked about that holy temple of the Lord. Verse 20, Ephesians 2.20 says, Ephesians 2.20 says that that temple is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. When you see that, don't, don't get tricked by churchianity and don't think, oh, apostles, Peter, James, and John, prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Don't think that way. Because remember from Ephesians 4, I mean, the, the immediate context in Ephesians is Ephesians 4 tells you that the apostles and prophets of this mystery, of this secret, Jesus appointed from heaven. So this is a different group of apostles and prophets than Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or Peter, James, and John. It's a different group. Uh, Romans 16, look at Romans 16. You got the same thing here. Romans 16. You know, you can think of it as like uh, God made a contract with Israel, and he says, if you believe me, then I'll give you eternal life my kingdom on earth. Well, God also makes a contract with today with Gentiles and says, if you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, well, then you'll have eternal life with me in heaven. So he's got two different contracts, similar results in that you're a sinner, you're saved by the blood of Christ, by believing the gospel that God gives you, and then, and then you're given eternal life in Christ. It's just we're in heaven, they're on earth. But you would figure if it's similar contracts and that God saves you from your sin through the blood of Christ, giving you eternal life in a realm that God controls, uh, then you would expect that the other elements would be similar as well. You know, if I made a contract, say I was a roofer, and I made a contract to build a roof on your house, but then I made a contract to build a roof on somebody else's house, say five miles down the road, um, the contract I make with the other person does not apply to you, and vice versa. Uh, but the terms of the contract I make with you versus the one I make with the one five miles down the road are going to be similar, because we're doing a similar thing. It's I'm going to build a roof, but I'll probably have different people do it, because if I'm doing it the same day, um, I can't have, I'm going to have one crew on your house and another crew on another house. We're going to have similar materials, you know, it depends on what we contract for, the amount and everything. Uh, but, so the contracts are different. You can't apply the terms of one to the other. 
but uh, the terms are going to be similar because we're doing similar things. Roofing jobs is just in two different locations for two different parties. So God gives eternal life by the blood of Christ to forgive the sins of Israel and same exact thing to forgive our sins today. Just we're going to be in heavenly places, they're going to be on earth. So the terms are going to be a little different because they're different locations, different circumstances, but the tools and everything going along with it would be very similar because God's doing a similar thing for both people. So that's why you'll see apostles and prophets in Israel's program and you'll see apostles and prophets for the body of Christ. Romans 16, Romans 16, verse 25. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Remember, that was the revelation of Jesus Christ. He did not get it from man. Therefore, Paul doesn't say Peter's gospel. Or he says, this is my gospel. The one that Jesus gave to me. I didn't get it from anybody else. I got it from Jesus Christ. It's my gospel. According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. Well, there you go again. There are the prophets mentioned. And you think, well, that throws a wrench into it because it must be out there in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Now, wait a minute here. If Paul says in Ephesians 3, if Paul said in Ephesians 3, this is the revelation of the mystery, and he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not known then how could this possibly mean the scriptures of the prophets? How could that possibly mean Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, all those people? It can't. Because it was kept secret, but now is made manifest. If it was revealed in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, if that's the prophets we're talking about, the prophets of Israel, then Jesus would not have been crucified on the cross. Because 1 Corinthians 2 says that if the princes of this world knew the hidden wisdom of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And if Jesus, if God revealed that hidden wisdom in the prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, that's before the cross, then Satan and his forces would have known that information and they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So if you try to say the scriptures of the prophets in Romans 16, 26 refers to Isaiah through Malachi, then God lied, you've got a contradiction in your Bible. But we know from Ephesians 4 that Jesus appointed apostles and prophets from heaven after he ascended up on high, after this death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, to, because we know God cannot lie, and there can't be any contradictions in our Bible, we must conclude that the scriptures of the prophets in Romans 16, 26 is Paul's writings. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14.37, in 1 Corinthians 14.37, if any man be, I don't want to misquote it here, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So the scriptures of the prophets are Paul's epistles based upon 1 Corinthians 14.37. So he says in Romans 16.25 and 26, He's preaching revelation of the mystery. Again, rev revelation of mystery that was kept secret, kept secret since the world began. And then we go over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, Peter tells you what he's preaching. This is after Acts 2. Remember that churchianity tells you that the church began in Acts 2. The body of Christ began there. It could not have began there because, because and they'll say that Peter and Paul preached the same message. But we see in Romans 16, 25 and 26 that Paul says, He's preaching the revelation of the mystery which is kept secret since the world began. And when Peter preaches in Acts 3, in Acts chapter 3, 
He says, verse 19, Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when? At Jesus' second coming, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Now that goes back to what we talked about in Acts 7 and Acts 2. What we talked about the first part of the message, first hour or so, is that we saw that God said in Acts 2, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. And then we see that he stood up. And so prophecy says that heaven, Acts 3.21, must receive until the times of restitution of all things. So until the 70 weeks are completed, Jesus Christ, in other words, he's saying in verse 19, your sins may be blotted out, but your sins are not going to be blotted out until Jesus Christ comes back. Why? Because right now, he must sit at the right hand of the Father until his foes are made his footstool. When his foes are made his footstool, then you've got the restitution of all things. Which God, all things, what things? Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So in Acts 3.21, Peter says, we're talking about things that God has spoken since the world began. But Peter says, I'm speaking about things that were kept secret since the world began. Therefore, by definition, since God cannot lie and there are no contradictions in your Bible, by definition, Paul has to be preaching a different message than Peter does. And so, going back to what we talked about earlier, Jesus was to sit at the right hand of the Father until his foes were made his footstool. Isaiah 3.13 says that the that he would stand and to judge, to plead, and to judge, he standeth to judge the people. And we saw that, that that couldn't have happened at that time because Daniel 9.27 had been fulfilled yet. I erased that. The, the, the 70th week of Daniel had not been fulfilled yet. There was no seven-year covenant with the Antichrist. There was no image of the beast halfway through the week. Uh, sacrifices didn't stop. All those events of that 70th week of Daniel had not taken place. Therefore, you, cannot, you do not have... Acts 3.21, the restitution of all things. So, even though Jesus stood up, and he was supposed, according to prophecy, he would sit until his foes were made his footstool, he cannot stand up and judge. In Revelation 19 says he comes sitting on a right horse, he's got the sword proceeding out of his mouth, which is the word of God, and he comes, his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives, and he fights in a battle against the Antichrist and his forces, and he soundly defeats them. And then he brings in the believing remnant, uh, Israel, believing Israel is resurrected, and uh, he leads them into uh, Israel, into Jerusalem. He sets up the kingdom there, and they are a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles in the millennial reign. That's what he does at his second coming. But he can't do that yet because Israel didn't believe. Remember, they, they were apostate. They, Acts 4, they arrested uh, Israel. Acts 5, they arrested apostles. Acts 7, they stoned Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost. They rejected that message. So, although Jesus provided the sacrifice, you don't have a believing remnant sufficient to be that kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles in the millennial reign. Therefore, he cannot, stand, he cannot restore all things. And so since you don't have that believing remnant set up, they're not ready. If the Antichrist, if at that time in Acts 7, if the Antichrist comes, you're not going to have, you know, Romans 11:26 says, all Israel shall be saved, meaning all the lost sheep of the house of Israel shall be saved. But if, if the Antichrist came and set up a seven-year covenant with Israel at the end of Acts 7, they would not, the lost, all the lost sheep of the house of Israel would not be saved. 
due to the apostasy of the nation. They weren't ready to believe yet. It's like God told Israel in the wilderness. He says, Numbers 14, He says, Moses, send 12 spies out, go into the land. I mean, the offer was there. You go into the land, you'll have life in that land. But they say, oh no, no, they're too big for us. They're giants, we can't do it. See, they didn't trust in God. So then uh, God says, okay, well, they're not ready yet. He says, I've said they could go into the land, but they didn't believe me. So since they believe me, them going to the land is put on hold. This generation are going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The next generation will go in. Jesus says in Matthew uh, 23, when he talks about the Pharisees, he calls them, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? So God looks at Israel in Acts 7. And he says, I sent you, John the Baptist, you beheaded him. I sent my only son, you crucified him. And I sent the Holy Ghost in Stephen here, and you've stoned him. You're not ready yet. You haven't believed yet. The offer of the kingdom is there. You read Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. It's today. While it is called today, if you will believe, you can enter into his rest. That's the admonition in Hebrews 3 and 4. They don't do it. So just like those in the wilderness, God says, I said you could go in, but you didn't believe me. Therefore, this generation has to die out. So what God says with Israel at the stoning of Stephen, he says, I gave you the promise. You could go into the land. You just didn't believe me. Therefore, this generation of vipers has to die out. And then we're going to have that believing remnant go in. So then the standing, when Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father there, that's where prophecy is put on hold. And that's why I said prophecy is put on hold and the mystery is going to begin with Paul in Acts chapter 9. Because God says, well, Israel isn't ready yet to go into the kingdom. They're not going to be a kingdom of priests. The lost sheep of the house of Israel is not going to be saved due to the apostasy of the nation and their, religious, their apostate religious leaders. Therefore, Jesus stands up, but instead of standing to judge, instead of his enemies being made his footstool, instead of bringing the restitution of all things, instead he stands... And it's not to welcome the first Christian martyr into heaven, although I'm sure that uh, he did receive Stephen into, into paradise there in heaven, uh, waiting for the new Jerusalem and for Jesus' second coming. Um, certainly that's the case. But the reason that Jesus stood wasn't to welcome him in. We're told he was to sit till I make thy foes thy footstool. And God says, Israel's not ready yet. So we can't, we've, we can't, we're not going to start the tribulation period. There's not going to be an antichrist just yet. It's going to be put on hold. And instead he stands and he offers grace and peace through Paul to the Gentiles. And this fulfills a prophecy. You can look at Hosea chapter 1. And I know we're out of time, so we're just going to, we'll stop here. Um, look at Hosea chapter 1. And he's, there's a prophecy of this happening. And it, you know, this is a good a verse also to show people who think that today we are spiritual Israel uh, because they say, well, you know, they crucified, Israel crucified their Messiah and so they didn't get the promises, so now we get their promises. Well, no, look at what Hosea 1 says. He says um, in verse, uh, verse 6, Hosea 1 verse 6, she conceived again and bare a daughter, Hosea 1 verse 6, God said unto him, call her name lo Rahoma. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned lo Rahama, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Lo-Amai, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So Hosea 1 verse 9 is a prophecy that Israel's program will be put on hold. Israel put on hold. Why are they not my people and I am not their God? Well, due to the unbelief. And But then, yet verse 10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, 
And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, that's of course Jesus Christ, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So, Hosea 1, 9 prophesies that there's going to be a time in the future where Israel is not going to be my people. Israel's program is going to be put on hold. But then Hosea 1, 10, the very next verse says that there will come a time when Israel will be God's people again. Now, of course, without the Holy Ghost revealing this to you, you couldn't figure this out. Um, but basically what it's saying there is the prophecy, basically the Daniel prophecy is put on hold, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, due to the unbelief of Israel. Hosea 1.9 is fulfilled at, uh, at the stone of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But yet, so then God's going to reconcile heavenly places back to himself through the nation of through the body of Christ there, and we see that with Paul in Acts chapter 9. But then after that takes place, then Israel will be God's people again, Hosea 1.10, which means, translation, we are not spiritual Israel. You notice this is a literal thing here. You notice verse uh, 11 then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head and they shall come up out of the land. You can see that's a physical land to a physical people called Judah and Israel. If we are spiritual Israel today, which one are we? Are we children of Judah? Or are we children of Israel? And how do you determine that? And what land are we coming out of? You know, I'm not in either Israel or Judah. I'm in Alabama in the United States. That's not anywhere in this passage. So I, I can't be this. So uh, these verses here tell you Israel's program put on hold. Israel will be God's people again. We are not spiritual Israel. Um, and so hopefully that shows you right out of time. Hopefully it shows you the prophecy program put on hold. The mystery program begins with Paul. What we're going to do next time is we'll go through uh, Romans 9. Uh, pr well, probably mainly Romans 11. So you can see, you know, why this is. Because that's another objection people have when you say, well, God starts the nation of Israel, the prophecy program, but then they don't believe him. So then uh, God puts that on hold. Then he starts the dispensation of grace. The gospel to Israel is different than the gospel today. Then we're going to be raptured up, but then Israel's program starts again, and then Israel's going to be saved. And one of the objections is, is that's way too confusing. God, uh, you know, he's... He's, you know, he'll do things a simple way. Why does, why, you're making the Bible too confusing. You're making, you're, you're creating these, you're creating all these problems. Actually, what you're doing is you're solving problems. You're actually understanding the Bible, but that's what they object to. So they'll say, why would God do it that way? You know, there's just one gospel. There's just one people of God. Uh, why would God say, Israel's my people, but then they're not. And now Gentiles are my people, but then Israel's my people again. Why would he do that? Romans 11 explains why he does that, and so we'll, we'll cover that next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the grace of God extended to us through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you that Christ lives in us, and that we have the Holy Ghost to teach us the things of God. Help us, Lord, to understand these things we've studied so that we can understand your word and use the mind of Christ and think clearly about spiritual things so we will be qualified for those positions in heavenly places, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.